In December 1941, the Imperial Japanese Army embarked on the Nanshinran, or Strike South, campaign. The Strike South campaign included attacks against European and American colonial holdings in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, Dutch East Indies, British Malaya, Singapore, and Burma, now present-day Myanmar. The Imperial Japanese Army needed to capture these colonies due to their abundance of raw materials, including rubber, tin, and oil. These resources were vital to Japan's war effort in China. The Imperial Japanese Army's doctrine of Soksen Suketsu, or rapid warfare, emphasized rapid maneuvers of light infantry around one or both flanks to envelop or cut off an enemy, even when greatly outnumbered. After an enemy was enveloped, he could be finished off and annihilated at close quarters, at which point superior Japanese elan and morale would win out. Japanese infantry training also emphasized the value of night attacks, surprise, and shock in overwhelming enemy defenses. In short, Japanese light infantry doctrine at the tactical level emphasized the seizure of offensive initiative and the fast movement to unhinge enemy defenses. In the Strike South campaign, the Japanese put their infantry doctrine into practice to great effect, particularly in Malaya and Burma. In both British colonies, fast-moving Japanese light infantry formations, often using bicycles for transport, consistently outflanked or enveloped static British defensive positions through jungles or bodies of water. These formations would set up roadblocks behind British positions and use captured British supplies to sustain their advance. Upon realizing the Japanese had outflanked them, British units would often withdraw in disarray and panic. It is noteworthy that British garrisons in both Malaya and Burma played directly into the hands of the Imperial Japanese Army, as many of their formations were road-bound, which was a disadvantage since they were overly dependent on motor transport. This led them to focus on defending roads and cleared areas while avoiding rough or difficult terrain, like jungles. Additionally, many British formations were dangerously overextended and forced to defend long or dispersed fronts along the frontiers and beaches of Malaya and Burma. This meant that British defenses had many gaps, little depth, and minimal reserves to stop rapid Japanese outflanking maneuvers in many places. Therefore, British units in Malaya and Burma were routed or annihilated in their engagements with Japanese forces during December 1941 and early 1942. The humiliating defeats in Malaya and Burma came as a shock to the British Empire. The British Army needed immediate solutions to stem Japanese rapid light infantry tactics. General William Slim, the new commander of the Commonwealth 14th Army in India, sought to find just a solution. Slim spoke to a Chinese officer who pointed out that the main weakness of Japan's light infantry columns was their very small administrative margin of safety, which is a reference to the supply limitations of these columns. These supply limitations enabled Japanese infantry units to move swiftly while traveling light. However, traveling light meant that the Japanese were often dependent on capturing enemy supplies to sustain operations beyond nine days. The Chinese officer noted that it was necessary to contain the Japanese advance for a prolonged period and then counterattack once they ran out of supplies. Only then could their outflanking maneuvers be checked and defeated. Slim used the information he learned from the unnamed Chinese officer to formulate the box as a tactical countermeasure to Japanese outflanking maneuvers. The box was a series of all-around perimeter defenses. Instead of forming a long, drawn-out front line, vulnerable to exploitation of gaps and flanking maneuvers, Slim's boxes would concede the Japanese temporary freedom of maneuver, but would also defend vital rear area installations, such as headquarters, communication lines, and supply depots from Japanese attacks. Panicked withdrawals would not occur as they had in 1941 and 1942. British units would hold their ground, considering the Japanese units in their rear, 
as opposed to themselves, to be cut off. The British could hold their ground because they could be resupplied by transport aircraft since Britain had established air superiority in Burma by 1944. Meanwhile, the Japanese would be forced to assault British boxes to obtain supplies from British stores and to establish a line of communication with their compatriots attacking the British from the front. Such attacks would fail against prepared British perimeters, forcing them into static positional warfare that de-emphasized Japanese centers of gravity, like initiative, light infantry maneuver, and elan, but also played on Japanese weaknesses, namely, lack of firepower and logistical support. Moreover, if the Japanese failed to capture British supplies within the first seven to nine days of an operation, the Japanese units would themselves be cut off from resupply, starved out, then annihilated by British reserves. The Second Battle of Arakan began with a British offensive in southern Burma with the 5th and 7th Indian Divisions in November 1943. The British commander of the 5th Infantry Division, Harold Briggs, attempted several fruitless frontal assaults against prepared Japanese positions. Predictably, these attacks failed in the face of interlocking Japanese bunkers and sophisticated trench systems. The failure of the British offensive forced them onto the defensive in the Arakan. Consequently, the Japanese began planning one of their classic outflanking maneuvers that had worked so well in Malaya and Burma in 1941 and 1942. A portion of the Japanese force would fix the 5th and 7th Indian divisions in place while a 7,000-strong force would outflank these divisions and threaten their lines of communication. The Japanese began their planned offensive on February 4, 1944. At first, all went well, as the Japanese cut off the 7th Infantry Division's line of communication through the Nudayak Pass and threatened the 5th Indian Division's line of Bazar Mangdal Road that served as the 5th Indian Division's line of communication. Nevertheless, these formations did not engage in panicked withdrawals as their predecessors in 1941 and 1942 had. Instead, they held their ground and formed all-around defensive perimeters called slim boxes. These boxes were sustained by aerial resupply with 1,600 tons delivered per day for 21 straight days. Slim's boxes were also able to hold out against repeated Japanese assaults from both the front and rear. Additionally, Slim's insistence on training rear area personnel for combat was vital in helping the British hold on to important rear area installations like supply depots and headquarters. At the same time, the lack of Japanese firepower limited their ability to suppress prepared British positions. Such realities meant the Japanese could not capture the vital supply depot at Sinzuea. The inability of the Japanese to capture Sinzuea doomed the 7,000 troops in the British rear area to starvation. Furthermore, the British Reserve 123rd Brigade attacked the Japanese units caught behind British lines in coordination with the 5th and 7th Indian Divisions. These attacks, combined with the effects of starvation and disease, combined to claim the lives of 5,000 of the 7,000 men who originally flanked British positions on February 4, 1944. While the number of casualties inflicted was relatively small when compared with other campaigns, the Second Battle of Arakan was important because it clearly illustrated the effectiveness of Slim's boxes against Japanese light infantry tactics. These boxes would later play a vital role in the battles of Imphal and Kohima when the Imperial Japanese Army attacked into eastern India. <laughs>